Hello Set Apart Saints, this is David, and in this video I'm going to talk about the mystery of iniquity that the Apostle Paul foretold in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-7. He said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, and that's the day of the Lord's return, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, and that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholds, what restrains, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now lets will let. In other words, he who hinders it's going to hinder until he's taken out of the way. So Paul is telling them that Messiah will not return until there is a falling away from the faith, until the restrainer is removed, so that the son of perdition can rise to power. But he says at the end of that part, he says that the mystery of iniquity is already at work at the time that he wrote the letter. He wrote Second Thessalonians around 51 to 52 AD, so it took place before that. He's saying that the false beliefs that would cause some to fall away and lead to the false religion of the son of perdition had already permeated the early assembly of saints. So, you know, just visualize what's going on. The gospel is being proclaimed throughout the Roman Empire by the disciples, by the early church. And to counter that, to counter Messiah's kingdom of assembly, of saints, Satan laid the foundation for his own Christian church. We see that in the fulfillment of Acts 8, 20-23, when Luke tells us about Simon Magus, whom the Sumerians deemed was a great power of God. He tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit and was rebuked by Peter. And so it says, And Simon, having beheld that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit is given brought before them money, saying, Give also to me this authority, that on whosoever I may lay the hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said unto him, Thy silver with thee, may it be to destruction, because the gift of God thou didst think to possess through money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this thing, for thy heart is not right before God. Reform, therefore, from this thy wickedness, and beseech God, if then the purpose of thy heart may be forgiven thee. For in the gall of bitterness and the bond of unrighteousness I perceive thee being. And make note of that, that Peter is proclaiming to Simon Magus, Simon the sorcerer, that he has a gall of bitterness in him. Okay, so he's declaring that because the reason I point that out is that the Roman Catholic Church says that the, their church was founded on Peter. Right? And that's what they say. And that's that's a false explanation. It's founded on Messiah. He's the cornerstone. But they say it's Peter. So it's interesting that Peter is rebuking Simon the sorcerer. And that'll make sense as we go through the study. So Simon, Magus, so Magus means Zoroaster, a practitioner, a priest of astrology and magic. Right? So back in Deuteronomy 29, it points to the iniquity of idol worship being gall and wormwood, bitterness. So Paul was proclaiming that Simon the sorcerer was a cause of bitterness and corruption to others. He was foretelling his future. He was making a prophetic statement foretelling his role, Simon's role, and how his teachings would mislead people. The Babylonian mystery religion influenced those in Samaria, which is where Simon Magus originated. So he used magic to deceive people, which gained him fame. Magus is the Chaldean word for priest, making Simon a false priest. And this is what Messiah warned about. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they were ravening wolves. So Simon the sorcerer was a forerunner of the Antichrist beast popes who pretend to be priests of Messiah, but really serve Satan's agenda. So after Peter admonished Simon, the sorcerer went to Rome to proclaim to be an apostle of Messiah. And deceive people and draw them under his authority. It appears that he formed his own church in the name of Jesus, Jesus in the Greek. Obviously, it wasn't Jesus at that point because there was no letter J back then. 
But in the name of Messiah, he proclaimed that he was the disciple. And so he became a bishop in Rome, a leader of the church designed by Satan to seek to overthrow the true assembly of Messiah. He blended the Babylonian mystery religion, which he knew from past teaching, right? The sorcery of the Babylonian mystery religion. And he blended that with Messiah's teaching to create a universal church that would attract all of Rome. Does that sound familiar? Is that not what the Roman Catholic Church is? A false church led by a Roman bishop filled with idols, which teaches a false messiah and a false gospel to deceive people. So from Simon's Gnostic teachings, a sect of Simonians flourished, preached a false messiah and a false gospel, and even taught that Simon was the Holy Father in human form to bring salvation to them. So we can see a direct connection from the sect of Simonians who revered Simon as the sun god and Helen as the moon goddess to what became the Roman Catholic Church where the Pope is revered as the sun god and Mary is the moon goddess, the queen of heaven. In 152 AD, in the first apology of Justin Martyr, Justin noted that the sect of Simonians appears to have been formidable as he spoke of the founder Simon four times. He describes him as a formidable magician who came to Rome in the days of Claudius Caesar. He was honored as a god with a statue erected on the Tiber bearing the inscription, the holy god Simon. So we see how he went to Rome and he was esteemed as a god. The word pater means father, as we find in the word paternal. We find this other Peter calling himself Simon the Father. And bishops of Rome preempted the old Mithraic high priest ancient title of Pater Patrum, which became Papa or Pope, meaning Father. The popes of Rome called themselves by the Holy Father, the Holy Peter. The Roman Catholic Church proclaims that Peter spent 25 years in Rome as the first bishop, the first pope, until he was martyred by being crucified upside down in the last year of Nero's reign. But the narrative of Peter being in Rome that long is easily proven to be false. His scripture shows that he's, he was in other places. So we can see that it was not the apostle Peter who was the first pope, but instead it was Simon the sorcerer. He set up the Babylonian priesthood of what became the Roman Catholic Church. The mystery of iniquity, which was started in the first century, became the false religion of Romanism. Pagan sun gods are symbolized by a pole or an upright stake, which are phallic symbols, sacred Peters. An Egyptian obelisk was erected in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican in the middle of a sun wheel. It sits in front of St. Peter's Basilica, the temple of their chief god, Simon Magus, the Holy Peter, and his successors, the popes of Rome. Simon Magus sought to prove his power and parody when Satan tempted Messiah to throw himself off the temple's pinnacle. And in a basilica in Vatican City, there's a stucco relief panel in the portico which presents the events in the life of St. Peter. And you can actually Google that term, the fall of Simon Magus, and look at the images and you'll see things like this, where you can see, <laughs> here he is jumping off the temple, being held up by you know, looks like a dark angel, right? Here's Peter and Paul praying against them, casting them down from power. This, this actually happened. This is a real event. It actually happened. So it shows that the apostle Paul was praying while Peter commanded the demons to let Simon fall. Magus reportedly broke his legs and was severely hurt and died a few days later. Now, losing Simon Magus, you know, the top magician, no doubt enraged Nero against Peter and Paul. And interestingly, Nero killed both of them. So we can see that the mystery of iniquity pointed to Simon Magus, the founder of what became the Roman Catholic Church of the Antichrist Beast Popes. Satan used Simon the Sorcerer, who pretended to be an apostle of Messiah, to set up the wheat and tares narrative. So this is what Messiah said. He said, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And they asked him, well, what should we do? And Messiah said, let God both grow together until the harvest and in the time of the harvest i will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn so interestingly in pointing to the desolation of rome's harlot church revelation 18 23 declares for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived and so we have come full circle from simon the sorcerer to the popes of Rome, deceiving the world with their sorcery. Revelation 17 and 18 point to the coming judgment of the harlot church when she will be desolated with fire. So 
the wheat and the tares. The tares are going to be gathered and burned with fire. We see the judgment of the harlot. She's going to be desolated and burned with fire. So we see this story and we see the big picture of the mystery of iniquity. We see, and I'll get into the transition into the uh, from the Roman emperors to the popes in a different video and all those things and how the Western Roman emperor was restraining the popes from taking power. But the main point of this is the mystery of iniquity was started in the first century by Simon Magus, which evolved into the bishops of Rome who gained more and more power, caused people to fall away from the true faith with a false gospel, with a false messiah. That evolved into the Roman Catholic Church, especially with Constantine in the 4th century. He had a great falling away from the faith, from people who, after many centuries of persecution by the Roman emperors, now joined with Rome, you know, in, in positions of power. So I hope you can see that point. It, it's a huge foundational point as we see the narrative, as we see now we have two churches, basically. We have Messiah's Ecclesia going out preaching the gospel, and now we have Satan's false church already in the first century, the foundation in the first century, going out and preaching a false gospel and a false Messiah. And that's the narrative of Revelation. This is one of the huge narratives, is these two are going forward through history, through the last 1900 years, and we're still there. Look at what's going on right now. There's 1.3 billion Catholics right now who are believing in a false gospel. I'm not saying nobody's saved, because there are people who are saved, I'm sure, because Messiah said, come out of them, come out of Babylon. But the point is, is that by and large, these people are believing in a false gospel. They're believing that Mary is the intercessor to the Father. So you can see the narrative that was set up in the first century is still playing out today. And the harlot's going to be judged, and judgment is coming on her, and... We can see how this whole narrative was set up in the first century. So I hope that helps. I've included a link to my YouTube Revelation Timeline Decoded playlist. I've included a link to my Revelation Timeline Decoded book in the description. If the video helped you, please hit the thumbs up. Comment if you have anything to add to the discussion. Subscribe to the channel if you've not done so. I will talk to you soon. Love y'all. Shalom.